Um, so just wanted you to know that the recording is happening. Um, if you would not like to be recorded, then simply uh, don't speak during the meeting, but you can chat. The chat is not recorded. Um, and if you have any concerns about appearing on a recording, you can contact Fair Vote Canada afterwards and they can remove you from the recording. Um, the recording is primarily being used because there was one board member who wanted to make this workshop, but who couldn't. And so they'll have the opportunity to watch it. And I know that Anita often uh, presents or she'll process recordings into shorter videos that can be, uh, can be watched again later. So um, it might appear on social media or on the Fair Vote website as a workshop or a training. Um, greetings from St. John, New Brunswick. Hi, Harriet. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, cool. So I'll get started. You are at the beginning of the Power of Your Story uh, workshop. My name is Anna Keenan. I'm a campaigner of all different sorts. And this is going to be an interactive workshop. We're going to have a few breakout rooms. I'm going to get you to do some work um, on pen and paper yourselves during this next hour and a half. Might be a little less than an hour and a half. We'll see. Um, but it's focused on developing what's known as a public narrative for a winning campaign. And I'm joining you from, as I said earlier, Epiquit, uh, known in colonial times as Prince Edward Island. Um, and I'm originally from uh, Australia, which is my funny accent, uh, the land of the Turbul Indigenous people. Um, and I think it's important to do land acknowledgements. Um, so yeah, Epiquit is the Mi'kma'ki name, the Mi'kmaq name for one of the seven districts of Mi'kma'ki, which is here in Atlantic Canada. Um, and the Mi'kmaq people have never ceded their sovereignty over this land. And I'm really delighted to see um, all of the work that is being done to empower the Indigenous voice within Canada and make sure that we can acknowledge the truth and reconcile and come to a new understanding of what it means to be Canadian. And I know that that's a, a, a fight that is integrally linked to what we are working on here, renewing our democracy through uh, proportional representation. So um, who am I? I was the Green Party candidate for this writing, MOLPEC PEI, in 2019. I will be running again in the next election. That was just confirmed a few days ago. You're the first people to know that publicly. I'm going to do a more of a media announcement in the next few days. Um, and yeah, increase the vote 17%. only have to get another 7 or 8% and, and hopefully I can get myself elected. Um, I was Elizabeth May's critic for democratic institutions and I've put in my application to, to um, continue in that role um, under the leadership of Annamie Paul as well. Um, I was the president of the Prince Edward Island Greens during 2016 and 17 when we just had one MLA and of course we now have eight MLAs which makes us uh, the official opposition in Prince Edward Island. Um, and during that time, I also ran the, uh, the plebiscite campaign on Prince Edward Island, which, as you may remember, um, resulted in a 55% vote of um, the voting public in favour of proportional representation. But it was not a binding referendum. It was only a, a plebiscite. And the Liberal government at the time um, decided to ignore the results and um, not go through with the change that had been voted for. Um, and therefore they lost 20% of their popularity and they were ousted roundly in the next election. Um, so there's still a lot of um, appetite from the public for change on PEI, but uh, the political class has not prioritized it um, strongly. So we're, we're looking at um, alternatives, alternative processes like a citizens assembly here on Prince Edward Island. Um, I, was the, I was for three years on the National Council Cool, Harriet, that your grandson is in uh, in Summerside. That's awesome. Um, and I, I'll, I'll be watching the chat and trying to incorporate some of what I see there. So it's really lovely to see everybody um, chatting when they're where they're joining from. Hi, hi to Wilfred in Ontario, and um, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, so. In my professional life, um, I'm a climate change campaigner. I've done that role for the Australian Conservation Foundation, avaz.org. I was with Greenpeace for five years and I've been with 350.org for the last three years. I work in an international role, not in the Canadian team. And I think that that's important for me to acknowledge because some people on this call might have quite strong opinions about the 350 Canada team's uh, current climate emergency alliance uh, campaign. So I just, 
feel like it's important for me to acknowledge that I didn't have any role in shaping that campaign and I'm actually not allowed to because there's a, a strong boundary between my partisan role with the Green Party and uh, any electoral work that uh, that 350 Canada does. So yeah, so what we're going to do in this workshop, we're doing the welcome and introduction now, then I'm going to do 15 minutes of discussion on the question of why why do we want to tell stories? What is the use of stories? Um, and then I'm going to go into the framework, which comes from uh, Marshall Ganser's organizing and leadership training, um, which was my main activist training back in the day, um, about the framework for constructing um, a story as part of public narrative, as part of influencing public opinion. Um, and then we're going to do about 20 minutes of uh, making it your turn. Um, so you're going to do a couple of exercises on a sheet of paper, um, write up, you know, try to apply the framework that I've given earlier to your own work. And then we're going to break out into groups of three or four people. You're going to share what you've come up with, with other people in a small room, and you'll give each other feedback. And uh, as a, a bit of a, an effort in practicing and learning together, then we'll come back to the main room. We can share a few thoughts on what we learned, what we noticed, um, give a little bit more feedback and learning. And uh, at the end, I can direct you to some more resources if you're wanting to learn more about the Marshall Gantz storytelling framework. Um, so that's what you can expect in the next hour and a bit. So you should leave with um, a, a bit of a framework for knowing how to choose which story to tell. We all have an infinite number of stories. There is not just one story for each of us. We all have stories about what we did this morning, what we did last year, what we did last night, um, and we can pick and choose any of these stories. So how do you choose which story to tell? Um, and then you'll have this framework for constructing um, a persuasive public narrative or a story of self, story of us, story of now, and you'll have practice doing it. So diving in, um, I want to ask, I want to spend a, a few minutes thinking about um, why do we tell stories? What is the use of storytelling in campaigning? And I'm going to ask this question um, and I'll invite you to respond in the chat. What happens if we don't tell our own stories? What happens if we fail to tell our own stories? I'll leave 30 seconds and if you've got ideas for that, you can type them in the chat. Cool. I like some of these, these responses coming in. So it can feel inauthentic. It can feel like um, we're just, we're just being logical and we're not moving hearts. You know, um, people can tune out if we lose that personal touch. Um, but I, I really like um, what Michelle and Mark have said here, which is that somebody else will tell our story for us. Um, Trump will tell our story for us. We'll fail to make a human connection. People can be lost. People don't relate well to just facts. You need, you need emotions. So all of this is really good content. Um, and we stop listening. We can stop, we, we won't have an audience if we don't tell our stories in an engaging way. Um, but I love what people are saying about someone else will tell our story for us. So if we don't tell our stories as members of the proportional representation movement, what are some of the stories that others say about people like us? What are some of the stories that other people who aren't part of our movement write about us? I know that in the environmental movement, people are often labeled as tree hugging hippies or latte drinking inner city elites that don't have any connection to the real world. Um, so what do they say about us in the proportional representation movement? We're a campaign run by people who are in the losing parties who don't uh, who can't get power, we just want power, they're too nerdy, 
it's an issue that's abstracted from daily life. They're not focusing on what's important. There's way more important. Um, every single member of Fair Vote Canada is part of the Green Party. Um, the PR people want to rig the system so their own party can win. Their heads are in the clouds, losers, dreamers. Um, policy wonks, naive, you know, all of those things. Yeah, people who are, Anne has said, our democracy is just fine as it is, which has this implication that all of us are creating a problem out of nothing. You know, we're just looking for drama when there's really no problem. Um, so those are some of the stories that people will tell about us if we don't tell our own stories. And we want to get good at telling our story. We want to have multiple stories. We want to get out there in the public and we want um, the more stories that we can tell um, the more that that becomes the dominant narrative if we leave a vacancy then other people are going to fill that void um, for us another reason to tell stories is this idea of there being two ways of knowing so um, you know some people call this left brain and right brain um, but you know I think some of you have already touched on this in the chat in one way of knowing there's analysis, how the, the sort of the head, um, the strategy, you know, the logic. So you deliberate based on experience, you think through it step by step and you figure out, you know, how can we solve this problem? Um, but, and that, that's all of the sort of logic and math side of it. And I, I have to say, I naturally tend in that direction. I, I'm a math graduate, um, <laughs> but, I've learned that if I want to create public influence, I have to I have to work very intentionally to activate this side of my brain that that is more it's not my natural tendency, which is the narrative, the storytelling, the why, the heart, the emotion. Um, and so this, rather than reflecting and and look on our past experience and analyzing it, we're looking at our past experience and um, constructing a narrative. It's affective. It's instead of logic, it's emotion. Um, so they talk about ethos, logos, pathos. So narrative is the pathos and it's the motivation. And these are two different ways of knowing that can create a shared understanding. Um, it's also really important to address the heart and the emotion because decision-making actually comes from the emotional side of our brain. Um, analysis can tell you how to act on any particular problem. It can give you the logic of how to solve a problem, but to actually have the motivation to do it, you need emotions to be activated um, because there's, there's heaps of problems in the world. I can think through strategies on how to, you know, solve the climate crisis, proportional representation, the Israel-Palestine conflict, agriculture issues, urban infrastructure issues. I can come up with, you know, logical solutions to thousands and thousands of problems, but I only have a limited amount of time. So which issue am I going to choose to turn my attention towards? That is a question of motivation. And where am I, um, where am I most motivated to spend my time and my hours? Um, so turning values into action requires emotion in the middle. Um, values inspire action um, only through emotion. Our emotions can tell us what we value. So if, if something is threatened and we feel angry about that, then it's an indication of something that we value. But decisions to act, um, to address or to change any situation only follow sort of emotional judgments about our values. Um, so there's a bunch of emotions here on the left, um, which are called action inhibitors. So if there's a sense of inertia, things are never gonna change. Apathy, people don't care about this. I'm afraid of taking action because it's gonna be risky. If I don't believe in my own power, if I have self doubt around my own efficacy, I'm unlikely to take action. Um, or if I feel isolated and alone, like I'm the only person who cares about this thing. These are all things that will hold me back from taking action, even if logically I know what needs to be done to solve the problem. But we can activate different emotions that can help to overcome these inhibitors. So we can uh, develop a sense of urgency and that can over overcome a sense of nothing's ever gonna change. 
we can talk about the urgency of right now and how there's an opportunity in this moment that we have to seize before we lose it. And that can be a great um, emotional motivator. Instead of apathy, nobody cares about this. There's stories that help people to feel angry. And anger is this sort of emotion that is often labeled as negative but um, it is actually a very strong motivator. There's this, it's not enraged anger we're talking about here, it's anger at injustice and a sense of injustice um, and unfairness. Um, then there's fear and that can be overcome with hope. Um, you know, this fear of acting that, you know, people are gonna think I'm weird if I do this or um, I'm gonna put in all of this effort and it's, it's not gonna work out. Um, Obama was famous for activating hope in his messaging, all the hope and change messaging. Together we can do it. Yes, we can. Um, and even yes, we can, it sort of activates all of these last three emotions. Um, hope, you can make a difference. Together we can do it. Solidarity, you're not alone. Um, and so that's what I, I, I still really love that, um, that phrase, yes, we can. And I try to I try to activate the emotion of, of solidarity and togetherness in in any campaign that I'm working on. Um, so you can't uh, generate these emotions on the right purely with logic. It comes through stories. It comes through storytelling. Um, so here's the framework for stories for how we develop them. And I'll give credit. I mentioned this earlier to Marshall Gantz. Um, he is the professor um, who started a course called Organizing and Leadership at the Harvard Executive School in Boston. And uh, Marshall Gantz came out of the union movement in the US and he was a primary advisor to um, the Obama 2008 campaign. Um, he's a, a really inspirational professor and I encourage you to check out his work. So in constructing a story, and this is what I'm gonna ask all of you to do shortly. Um, there are three elements. There's always a moral of the story, a character and a plot. And as part of the plot, there's three elements again. You have a challenge that the character faces, the character makes a choice, and then there's an outcome from making that choice. Um, it can be a good outcome or a bad outcome, but either way, the the challenge, the choice, and the outcome demonstrate the lesson or the moral of the story. And so we're gonna to try to work through um, those elements in practice today. So I'm gonna go through a few examples. I took like a half hour to brainstorm a bunch of stories um, earlier today. So I'll try to, to read these out. Um, first of all, you have to think of who's like an imaginary audience or a real audience that I might be speaking to. Um, if, I, if I'm speaking about young people, if I'm speaking to an audience of young people who are feeling disempowered on housing issues in PEI, um, then the moral of the story that I want to communicate is by joining an organization and acting together, like you, you can contribute to effective activism. And so then I think, okay, what's a story that I have from my life that demonstrates this, um, this moral? And I can tell a story of when in 2007, as a young activist myself, I was really sick of reading and just learning about the problem of climate change. I wanted to do something to help. So I made a choice. I heard about Al Gore's climate project. I'd just watched the film An Inconvenient Truth and I looked him up and I saw that there was an opportunity to join his activist project that was coming to Australia. So I applied and volunteered and I went to Sydney for three days of training after making that decision and that choice to volunteer over the next year, I personally gave about 50 presentations about climate change science to, um, to all different sorts of audience or to all different sorts of audiences. On average, it was 200 people per presentation. Some presentations, one presentation had 3000 people. The smallest presentation had like 10, um, but in total it added up to me personally reaching 10,000 people talking about climate change during the year 2007 and eight. And it was a measurable outcome. Um, together, myself with the other trainees, we shifted public opinion in that year and we shifted media coverage of climate change in Australia from next to nothing 
to a very loud roar by the end of the year. And so I started feeling disempowered and I came out feeling like I had made a difference. And that's one example of a personal narrative um, that I could choose if I was trying to communicate with people who are feeling disempowered and like they're trying to find their own path today. Another example, um, proportional representation activists, let's say, um, and the story that I'm wanting to get to get through is the idea that education or awareness or inspiration is not enough. As activists, we need to learn to be strategic to organize effectively. So, uh, oh, just a second. <laughs> Um, so, okay, the, the story that I can tell that demonstrates this moral is in 2008, I went to my former high school as part of that program I just spoke about in 2000 with, with an inconvenient truth. And I did this big presentation about climate change and I got people really fired up um, about the issue. And I invited people, I said, you know, I was speaking to an audience of 800 people at my old high school. Um, I was a few years older than all of them. And 100 of them followed up on my invitation to come down at lunchtime to the school hall. And we're going to talk about how we can take action on climate change here in the school. Um, but and then I said, I'm going to come back every week on Wednesday and we're going to see what we can do together. I had 100 people the first week. I had 30 people the next week. I had five people the next week. And I felt really disempowered <laughs> um, because I did not yet know. Oh, I did not yet know how to organize a group effectively. So I learned from that. And the choice that I made going forward was that I had to speak with experienced campaigners and activists, not about the issue and about like, how do I talk about climate change? I already knew how to do that, but I needed to learn the skills of how to be a community organizer, what to do when a hundred people get into a room and want to take action on an issue. What's the next step that I do um, to make sure that people are going to come back and we're going to come out of this with an effective campaign? Um, and so I spoke with a lot of activists. I um, listened, I learned, I asked for training. Um, and now, community, or, you know, 13 years later, community organizing is my full time profession. Um, I've worked on hard issues on proportional representation, lots of campaigns on climate, getting Greens elected, bike friendly communities, and I'm having success and making change. And now looking back, I know what I would have done in 2008 if I'd had that opportunity with 100 um, really revved up young women who were wanting to make a difference in the room again. Um, so that's another story from my life. I've got two more examples I think I'll share. I hope these are useful for you. We're gonna get you to do a similar exercise shortly. Um, actually, one, one thing I'll point out about these last two examples is that the audience that I'm speaking to and the topic of my story don't necessarily have to line up. So here I was thinking about people who are talking on housing issues and I told a story about climate action. Here I was thinking about proportional representation activists. And again, I told a story about climate action because that's my, that's my personal experience. But the lessons from one topic area are translatable to another. Um, if you are a carpenter and you have stories of the challenges you have faced in carpentry, those same challenges and choices will probably show up in the field of campaigning as well. Or you know, if you, whatever your profession, um, you will have stories and lessons from one context that are applicable in any other context. Um, so the next story I want to share is, um, rather than it being a group audience, it's a story that I, I shared yesterday with my five-year-old son. <laughs> he was struggling to use his bow and arrow tool um, effectively. He was sort of dropping it. Um, and, uh, you know, he was getting really frustrated and I wanted to tell a story that would teach him a lesson. If you want to do something yourself, and he, he didn't want my help, you know, he, he was saying, no, I don't want you to do it for me, mom. I don't want you to do it for me. But he was getting really frustrated and I could see that he needed some knowledge that he didn't have yet. So I wanted to tell him a story of, um, of yeah, that, that shared the moral 
sometimes you have to listen to your teachers first so that you can then become independent and do something differently. Um, so I shared a story. I had this challenge one time, uh, this is a few years ago. I was wanting to fix my own roof. So <laughs> um, we had moved into a new house. We were DIY renovating our country home. Um, but as a young woman, no one had ever really taught me how to, how to do that before. Um, people had taught my younger brother because that's the sort of thing that, you know, young men get invited to do all the time, but I hadn't had that opportunity. And I wanted to prove that I could do it myself, um, but I couldn't figure out how to load the nail gun. <laughs> I had all of these roofing nails and I couldn't figure out how to get them into the tool. Um, and there was no manual for the nail gun around. Um, so I had a choice. I could either continue to struggle for, you know, probably another hour to figure it out, or I could just ask the person who knew, which was my husband, whose father is a carpenter, um, not to do to do the job for me, but just to give me a tip um, and to teach me how to use the tool that I needed to be able to do it myself. So I swallowed my pride. I went and asked for help. I got the tip. And within a few minutes, I had that tip that I needed. And I went on to spend the next few hours nailing roof shingles onto the roof. I did it myself. <laughs> I still did it myself, um, but there was no shame in asking. And so that's a story that I told to my son. And then I managed to convince him, yeah, okay, mom, you can show me the tip that you've got for how to use, um, how to use this bow and arrow. Um, so stories come up in all sorts of different contexts. And I just, I wanted to show, um, to show all different examples of where this same framework of challenge, choice, and outcome um, can, can appear. Uh, the last example I've got is the local proportional representation campaign. Um, this is a real story that I remember telling to a meeting. There was a, there was a meeting where all different groups working on proportional representation were coming together. There was a little bit of territorialness uh, um, around who owned what volunteers and which volunteers would go with which group. And the moral of the story I wanted to communicate was that nobody owns volunteers, only volunteers own themselves. Um, so volunteers will go where they feel most persuaded, where the best strategies are, where they personally feel like they're most effective and can make the biggest difference. So my message was don't worry about the competition between similar organizations, just do what you do as best you can and whichever organization has a more appealing strategy for different sorts of people will attract volunteers. We shouldn't try to engineer that. Um, so I could have either just said that as a principle, but I knew it would be more effective communicating it as a story. So I shared back in 2015, when I used to work for Greenpeace, maybe this was 2013 even earlier, um, Organizers in Greenpeace's US student network were feeling real, really annoyed that many of their student groups that they had worked to develop on various campus, campuses were starting to work on 350.org's fossil fuel divestment campaign. The national organizers on staff at Greenpeace faced a choice. They could either, you know, try to draw a boundary and say that 350 can't talk to Greenpeace groups or they could allow it. Um, they weighed up the consequences of both of those options and they realized that it would cause a lot of uh, negative consequences if they tried to prevent activists from talking with 350 and that you know we wanted to be movement generous and be good collaborators. So they let go of their annoyance and they welcomed 350 to continue talking to their student activist groups. And as a result, some of those student Greenpeace groups um, became part of the fastest growing movement in history, the fossil fuel divestment movement. They managed to divest their campuses. And as of 2021, $14 trillion in managed assets have been divested from fossil fuels and they got to be part of that movement. Um, and there are good relations to this day between Greenpeace and 350.org. Um, so that was a story I chose to share with my local proportional representation campaign group when they, we had the question of, you know, who gets the volunteer list that we developed in 2016, who's going to use it in 2019? And we said, let's, let's just be open about it. Cool. So I hope that sharing those examples helps to give you an example of the framework in action. Um, now it's going to be your turn. So 
as the first task here, you can choose a proportional representation campaign or project or any other campaign or project that you've got going on in your life. Um, I want you to spend two minutes thinking about it and I'll describe these prompts and then I want you to type your your desired moral of the story into the chat. So you'll get two, two whole minutes to think about it. It's quite a lot of time. Um, so I want you to think about why you want to tell a story. Who do you want to tell the story to? And what are the emotions that might be preventing them from taking action? And what's the action you want them to take? Or what's the choice that you want this person to take? Um, you, and all of these considerations are helping you to, to define why would I want to tell a story? So have a think if you can identify an audience, an action you want them to take and what might be holding them back from taking that action. And then what's the moral of the story that you might want to convey to help overcome that inhibiting emotion. So I'll give you two minutes, think about it. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, but then we'll type it in the chat. So I'm watching the clock and I'll let you know when 90 seconds have passed. All right, so I think we're at 90 seconds. So whatever you've got, type it into the chat now and we'll see a few examples. Cool. I'm seeing a few different examples, um, a few different morals here. So that's cool. People are getting like their intention clear about why they might want to tell a story or what's the lesson that they want to come out of the story. I think it's always important that we start developing our stories from the point of view of what's the goal, what's the reason I'm telling the story, what do I want to get out of it? And then that'll give you a lot of clarity around what you have to put, um, what you have to find to put into your story. Um, I, I've seen some like side chat as well around um, telling stories one on one versus telling stories to a whole audience. And I just want to note that if you have a good handle on public narrative, you can use storytelling in multiple different contexts. You can use it on social media, you can use it in public speaking, um, you can use it in a group workshop, or you can use it one on one in, um, you know one-on-one -on -one discussion. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of different examples here. I'm not gonna like 
analyze and tell you if the moral of the story is right or not because everybody um everybody will have their own stories that they want to tell i just want to make sure that everybody's got something that they're committed to so that's awesome um and i, I just want to make sure as well that um that the moral or intention of your story is related to action um so what's the action that you want people to take um should sort of be be implied or be part of the purpose of your story so. cool all right i'm seeing some some really good examples in the chat um so now i'm going to give you five minutes of solo work time and then we're going to go into small groups and share so take that idea that you've just developed that's your purpose the knowledge uh or the so that's the purpose or the moral for your story. And I want you to come up with a time in your past um, where you are the character, or maybe it's a friend or someone you know who is the character, or it could be your community as a group um, that faced a challenge that helps to demonstrate the moral of the story. So identify really clearly what is your challenge. Then what were the options that you had in response to that challenge and which one did you choose and why did you choose that and then as the final part of your narrative was it a success or a failure would you do the same or would you do it differently if you had the chance to do it again and what did you learn from making that choice in response to that challenge and it's sort of challenge choice outcome and then the result of that should be the moral of the story that you have just identified. So I'll pause here and ask, are there any questions about this before we go into five minutes of silent work? Can I get a thumbs up on the video if people are clear on what the task is and are ready to try it? Cool, I'm seeing a bunch of thumbs ups. So I'll just put my, my um, a couple of people are saying I don't feel confident, you know, that's okay. <laughs> the uh, part of doing this work in a workshop space is to, to learn and to give it a try. Um, so I'm going to leave this up on screen. I'm going to go um, on mute for five minutes and at 45 past the hour, I'll come back and I'll give the next instruction, which is where we're going to break into groups and don't worry about getting it right um because there will be uh there'll be time to get feedback so um okay i see a few people saying that i'm moving a bit fast so maybe i'll i'll uh <laughs> yeah thanks jim for your comment that's very uh it's, yeah wise um adina you've said it's moving a bit fast or connie you've said you might be misunderstanding the meaning of various terms so do you want to say more about that and i can try to clarify before you go ahead Okay. No worries. Okay. I think we'll go into silent reflection. And for those who are, um, don't worry about typing out your story. We're actually going to share stories verbally in small groups and get everybody talking. Um, so there's very little typing for the remainder of the, um, for the remainder of the story. Um, cool. So yeah. Five minutes of work time on your own on paper um, so that you've got a record. You don't need to type it into the chat, but try to write out in response to that moral of the story, the intention behind your story, what's the challenge, the choice, and the outcome of a story that's happened in your past that reflects um, the moral that you're trying to communicate. So I'll leave it for five minutes from now. Thanks.
So we've got about a minute left of work time. And don't worry if it's not perfect, because we're going to get in small groups and you'll have the opportunity to learn and hear from other examples in your small groups. All right, so I'm going to um, I'm going to move us on to we're going to break up in, into small groups. Um, I want to say that if you feel like you don't have anything to share or you're feeling really introverted and like this is very vulnerable, <laughs> you don't have to share in your small groups. You can just say I'd prefer to listen to others. You know, that's fine. Um, but I would encourage you to try sharing whatever you've got. I'm sure that everybody here are very supportive and, uh, you know, encouraging people. Um, and, uh, you know, that this will be a safe space for you to make mistakes in. So that's the important thing. This is also not a public speaking exercise. This is about um, designing a story. When you describe your story, it can be full of ums and ahs. You don't have to worry about your tone of voice, you know, all of that. Um, you've got time and space to work on that in, in other workshops or, you know, to, to do practice, but this is really just very casual. Um, so what I want us to do is to break up into groups of three or four people. Um, I'm going to get Michelle to set up our breakout rooms. And I just want you to, to um, each person to sort of go around and say, yeah, I'll share my story. Um, describe who you're imagining telling this story to and then go through tell your story of you know, there was a time when i faced a challenge the challenge was this this is what i chose to do and this is what came of it and the moral of the story is you know this so try to go through that each story should take just a minute or two um or however long um however long you've chosen to make it um, try to share the time equally and for everybody who's not telling a story in the breakout room, you're about to become a peer coach. So all of us have a natural innate sense of what makes a good story or not. Um, and I want everyone to listen to your, the, your peers in the breakout room and give them one piece of useful, usable feedback. Um, that was really good is not a particularly useful piece of feedback. Um, take, give them something that they can use to make their story better next time. Just one piece, not a deluge of 10 things, but maybe try to pick out one element of the story that you think that they could strengthen. Listen as they are going through their present, their story for what was the challenge that the character faced? What was the choice that they made? What was the outcome? And was the moral of the story clear? Um, and then maybe give a tip or an idea for how they could strengthen one of those parts. Um, and as I mentioned, it's not about public speaking. So try to stay away from comments about tone of voice or, you know, you had too many ums and ahs and you should speak more confidently. We're, that's not what we're doing today. Um, and you'll have about 15 minutes for this exercise. Um, Michelle points out breakout rooms are not going to be uh, recorded. I'll address some of the questions in the chat now. Um, Rial has said, it occurs to me the story does not have to be positive to be part of a good story. Um, you know, we all have challenges that don't work out well, but there are lessons that we can be learned from choices that were bad choices as well that we might have done differently. So that's a very um, valuable insight, Rial, for sure. Um, and then Gisela is saying she's got a, a great moral. Um, I can see that she's saying, I want people to understand there's a better way to do politics, that all our voices can all be represented. The audience is inhibited by a fear of the unknown. I want them to be moved to give PR the benefit of the doubt. The moral of the story is 
that you want to communicate. If you don't ever take a risk and try something new, you'll never find better ways to do new things. The problem is you can't think of an example to illustrate the issue. So what I would ask Gisela, if she's trying to find a story to illustrate that moral, that you need to take a risk and try something new and find better ways to do things, there are probably very small examples in your day-to-day -day life. Maybe look at even the last week. What is something that you, what is something you've done when you took a risk and tried something new and you found out a better way to do things? You know, it could be a very, very small um, example, um, but that's a, it's a great moral. And I'm sure that you've got an example sometime in your history of where you tried something new and learned a better way. Um, so that's great. And Marilyn asks, will the groups be recorded? No, the groups won't be recorded. Tom asks, I'm wondering if it needs to be a personal story versus a story of a public figure. I encourage you to try to think about personal stories because people connect with you. Um, and we need to not be afraid of telling our own stories. Um, so try to, you know, try to make it about yourself if you can and your own story. You'll tell your own story better than telling anybody else's story. Um, but if you have a story of a public figure, um, that's equally valuable. Um, you know, I, I encourage you to try it. So. Um, great. Okay, I think I've answered all of the questions that were in the chat. So, Michelle, will you break us into uh, groups of three to four people for 15 minutes? I was just going to ask how much time. Yes. Yeah, 15 minutes. So it should be five minutes a person. A person can share a story for two or three minutes and then get two or three minutes of feedback from the others in the room. Good luck, everybody. See you back here in 15. Anyone who's not currently in a breakout room, I think you have to click a button to join the room that you've been assigned to. So it's just Mark. I will put Mark in your room. Oh, oh I can't actually. Seems like some rooms have five people, three to five people. So. Yeah, so, which is strange. We can just leave it. They can deal with having five. Yeah. So. Okay. Oh, Mark has opted out. Okay. Do you want us to move you to a room and everyone? Might like Sorry about that. Right when all of the rooms came back, my five-year-old walked in. He's very upset about um, his Lego toy that he assembled only having four wheels and not six. He thought it was going to have six. So he's going to find his dad who will console him about uh, the four-wheeled forklift. Um, cool. Well, I I cookies would do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I apologize if 15 minutes was not enough time to get through everybody in your group, but I also apologize for if there was a very abrupt ending on your Zoom rooms, that sometimes happens. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear if there were any, I'll, I'll start with, were there any learnings or noticings that came out of the Zoom rooms that people would like to share? Any insights about storytelling that came up? And you can put a, a star in the chat to raise your hand, or I see Anne Douglas has raised her hand on the uh, using the Zoom function. Anne, would you yeah. like to speak? Just even when I was telling my own story, something that seems to be crisp and clear and you know focused in your own head when you start telling it, um, often it's rambling and unfocused. And so you can even just start self-editing as you listen to yourself, so. 
I think that's right. Uh, nearly any time you tell a story the first time, it's going to be rambling and unfocused and you practice it and you practice it. You do it two or th three times and it's going to be much better than the first pass. And if you practice it 10 times, then you're going to get it like very refined. But there is no shame in starting with a rough draft. OK, if we're trying to make change, we have to embrace making mistakes and being a bit vulnerable. Um, I'll go to Jim next. Um we discovered in two, maybe all three of our stories, the feedback. So what was the moral after all? And so in telling the story, um, I certainly, and some, uh, I think some of the other stories left out the last brick in the bridge that would get us all the way to the moral that we wanted to deliver with the story. Yeah, thank you. I think the, um, the better that we get at telling stories, the more that we can construct the story so that the moral is just sort of obvious to everybody as you've told it. Um, but sometimes, especially when you're doing your first draft of the story, you do have to say, and therefore the learning is, you know, and what what you wanna, what you wanna say. But um, if you listen to a lot of Obama's public speaking, he very rarely explicitly says and the moral of the story is this and this and this you know or anything as as overt as that but he will tell the individual stories of himself growing up or his parents or voters that he has met and it's left implied and i think it's i think it's very effective so um you know if if we can get better at stories then we don't have to use the you know it's it's a real case of show don't tell um but uh you can you can of course do and the moral of the story is and make it clear and just tell it um while you're practicing and learning um early in your journey um i will go to shell goldstein next hi um i came up with a um a final line that i rather like uh, i offered hope i gained hope beautiful very very nice cool um real Real Laverne. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, it, it just took me a little while to find the little mute button there. Um, one of the things that, that I found as I was telling my story was I ended up weaving a story within a story. And I thought that was interesting since I didn't realize how much I actually used stories. <laughs> um, but so I just want to tell you about the story within a story. Um, what I was working on, I was imagining my MP as my audience and that my purpose was to you know the, the work that we're doing under Anita's leadership of convincing them to support the the proc motion for a citizens assembly and what kind of story I could tell about that and but, but the story within a story is is interesting because what I realized is that every time we organize a constituency meeting with an MP the very first part of what we do is a tour de table and the tour de table is basically everybody telling their story and how it relates to the moral, calling it a moral, uh, that we're trying to achieve with, with that MP. And, and I think that the, the language that you've uh, introduced to us here, uh, Anna, and, and this way of thinking, uh, I think will inspire us to have more effective tour de tabs in the future, now that I realize what it is that we're actually asking people to do in that part of the meeting. Very good. Oh, well, I'm glad to have given you a, a concrete tool you can use. Cool. I'll do uh, two more comments from Fiona and Tom, and then I'm going to ask if anyone had a really strong example of a story in your group. Maybe you want to nominate someone else who is in your small group who had a really great story. Um, I'll take any nominations in the chat and we can maybe hear, hear some good, inspiring examples of stories that were shared. Um, I'll go to Fiona and then Tom first. Fiona, go ahead. As I was telling my story, and after I had finished doing it, um, I thought I was I was, thought I was working towards illustrating one thing. And then right after I'd done it, I realized maybe there was another thing actually that it had to tell me that was possibly more um, more interesting and more important. There you go. Stories can have multiple learnings, multiple aspects. Yeah, our, our lives are complex and narrative and not sort of robotic and easy to put into boxes. So I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that, Fiona. And Tom. Tom Cullen, you had your hand raised or do you already? Uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot I had to unmute. Um, so my scenario is again, talking to actually, he's currently my MPP, but he's he's not he's running for the nomination of the, the federal um, 
anyway, the, he tends to be uh, very reticent to take a position on lots of things, including PR. Um, and I know him fairly well, and we've, we've talked about PR and climate uh, both quite a bit. Um, so my thought was to come up with a story where the, the character and the story uh, demonstrated leadership and succeeded. Uh, so my first example was, a well, actually, my first thought was Obama um, in terms of his whole election victory and so on. And then I thought, oh, it has to be personal, um, and I could talk to him about lobbying, which is something I never did until 10 years ago. Uh, but I thought Trudeau is a, a much better example. Look, look at what happened because he's not only is an example in, in the abstract, but he's an example on the topic of when in 2015, he promised 1800 times to make that election the last by first past the post. He got a, a landslide of support and votes. Uh, and uh, so I'm in trying to encourage um, uh, this fellow uh, to also demonstrate leadership. And I guess there's another example would be Nathaniel Erskine Smith, who has spoken out against the government and voted for PR uh, as a liberal, another liberal backbencher, which is the position he aspired, my guy aspires to. Um, anyway, so that's my story. I guess I'm still vacillating about the, the the need to have it make a personal story as opposed to is it more power to powerful to have it um, a more specific story like Nathaniel Erskine Smith or even Trudeau. Mm. Yeah, and and your choice there, I think you've you've raised it. Uh, you you've raised a, a good point, which is that if your specific audience is someone who's aspiring to be a liberal MP maybe they will be more inspired by characters which are closer to them and that are you know people who they already admire for example um so you know you, you could try that um you can also tell multiple stories that have the same um the same moral one from your own experience one from watching um public figures like nate, nate erskine smith um or justin trudeau um that all sort of get to the same uh towards the same uh emotional moral of the story. Um, so that's great. great. Um, I've, I've had a nomination in the chat. Uh, Mark has nominated Jim Della Hunt to tell a story. He says, Jim has a great story and he's open to share it. Um, so I would ask Jim if you would be willing to be, uh, to, to share your story with the 54 participants um, that are remaining on the workshop. Oh. I'd be happy to. Should I start now? Please. Do you want us to imagine that we are a certain type of audience? Well, last night there was um, a session, the panel discussion, and in the chat, a discussion broke out of should we be supporting MMP or should we be supporting STV or there's another kind of PR that somebody said was actually much better than STV and what about um, ranked ballots for single member writings and so on. And we were squabbling in the chat about that. And I remembered back in 1999, I was part of this small scrappy group advocating for marriage equality for same sex couples in California. Now back then marriage equality was so scary that not even politicians from what should have been the friendly party would accept our stickers. Um, and we wanted marriage equality, which was the full equality of full rights. But at the time, some people and some governments were offering these lesser compromises like domestic partnerships or civil unions. And so within our marriage equality group, we had the choice of rejecting these compromises as inadequate or celebrating them as steps forward, but yet not enough. And so I advocated that we should celebrate them all as incremental victories and then say, but they're less than full equality, so they're not good enough. So what happened was these lesser compromises started happening. This company puts out a domestic partner registry, that state um, offers civil unions, um, this state wins a lawsuit, and, and each one we celebrated as an incremental victory. But when we celebrated, we got attention, and when we got attention, we said, but here's the end goal, and this is why the incremental victory is not good enough as the end goal. And we discovered that places that did the incremental victories didn't stop there. This domestic partnership registry became a civil union. The civil union became marriage equality over time. So celebrating the incremental victories did not stop us from reaching all the way to our end goal. 
And so that's what I would be saying to the chat from last night is, um, if MMP is not your favorite system, if PQRST is really your favorite system, celebrate the incremental victories. That, that was a great story. Can we have a round of applause for Jim? There we go. <laughs> really nice, really nice. And uh, to a, um, a very uh, targeted audience, which is I think you know, this group of people here, uh, we probably get uh, hung up on the the system wars all the time um but i love what you've said about um always maintaining and advocating for your end goal and celebrating incremental steps along the way and i could tell other stories about um yeah that that teach the moral of like never compromising on your goal or, or pretending that an incremental step is the end goal always always aim for the end goal and you'll pull uh, people along with you so yeah very cool I have to think about an example to tell that same that same story but if you practice um, generating and telling stories then you'll have them in your back pocket able to pull out at a moment's notice um, so that instead of doing what I just did there which is like yeah and there's another moral of the story which I could explain you'll actually have you know that that reminds me of back in you know the 70s when you know, well I wasn't around in the 70s but I, I I've had the privilege of working with some longtime activists who were and they've told me great stories from those eras um, so it's very cool awesome we are approaching the end of the hour and a half we have taken nearly the whole time so that's cool um, I'll just share a few final slides um, before we wrap up um, this has been a very brief introduction um, We've mainly focused on what I would call like the story of self, um, which is like part of your own history and or somebody else's history and why um, it uh, connects into a, a moral of the story. You can also use the same framework of challenge, choice, action to tell the story of us a group, whether that is your family or Fair Vote Canada or Obama always did America as a nation, you know, <laughs> that you can tell a story of your province or your community or um, your organization. Um, and then there's another element of public narrative that Marshall Gantz trains people in. Again, it's, you know, challenge, choice and outcome, but it's the moment of now. So after you've told these historical stories that get people motivated and engaged and um, feeling emotionally committed and ready to take action, then you offer them the story of what's the challenge that we face right now? What's the opportunity we face right now? What are the choices that we can make in this moment? And if we make this particular choice, what's the outcome that we can expect? So it's still challenge, choice, outcome but you're bringing it to this moment and therefore what's the choice that we want to make. And ideally when you're telling a public narrative, you're, they're able to make that choice with you in the moment. You know, they can sign up to be a volunteer. They can make a donation to your campaign. You know, they can do all of these different things. If you make a donation to this campaign, the charter challenge for, uh, you know, fair voting, then, you know, we're going to go through this process and we're going to end up getting PR. Um, that's that's an example of the story of now. Um, Tom, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Or was that from earlier? Yeah, it was a really good question that came up from another fellow in our breakout. Um, and he said his battery was running low. So I'll just re hopefully I can reiterate it uh, successfully. Um, he said uh, that any kind of conversation relies obviously on listening. And um, I suggested, and I don't know this is the case, so you can clarify, if storytelling would be only appropriate to come up after a relationship has been built and the conversation is, is it's not an opening gambit. First, you would listen to the other person about in terms of their position on whatever the topic is first, right? Can you just elaborate a tiny bit about that? Yeah, sure. You, you want to know your audience and have a good sense of what is holding them back from action so that you know that you're telling the right story. Um, so one of the things that I've done in, I've, I've done lobbying training for people who are going to meet their MPs. And 
one of the things that I try to encourage people to do is rather than diving in with, and maybe Rial, this is another uh, training I can offer for you. Um, but the, rather than diving in with your stories and like sort of beating them over the head with like your perspective, it's really, you know, asking them, you know, what's preventing you from taking action on this issue? And maybe they'll say, well, I just don't think that there's much of a public demand for it, in which case your job is to demonstrate public demand. Or maybe they're saying, well, I know that there's a lot of public demand for it, but really, you know, the Liberal caucus is uh, very divided on this. And I'm afraid of going out on a limb and being alone, in which case you can, you know, your task is then to say, well, you're not alone in this because there are others within your caucus who feel the same way and I'd be happy to connect you to them. And, you know, so figuring out what their barriers are that you um, that you want to overcome, um, I think is is key. So, yes, listen first diagnose what stories you want to tell and why, and then um, motivate people into acting. Um, yeah, and then, um, what else? let me put my screen share back on. Cool. I don't wanna go over time because I've got a, the weather is amazing outside in PEI. It's like the first summer day and we've got a, a family barbecue happening. So I'm gonna get to that really quick. Um, so we've got these three public narrative, story of self, us and now. Um, the story of self shows why I'm called to, to work on this issue or to take this action or to demonstrate a certain moral that we identified. Us, as I mentioned before, I think, I, think I, I, I discussed this on the previous slide. It shows that the group has done great things before and has the resources and skills that we need that we can do it together. And the story of now is about our moment our challenge, our choice, and the outcomes we can expect. Um, so you're asking people to make a certain choice in this moment. Um, so that's it, that's the end of the slides. And I'm going to, what I'll do is I'll share this slide deck with all of you and with Anita. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. And it's probably just shared privately now, but I will change that in two minutes time so that anybody can access the slides. And I've got some links to recommended resources on the final slide. Um, so there's a, a, a book called Organizing People Power Change. I think every activist should read it and be familiar with it. Um, share it around your activist groups. Um, I've got a link to my slide deck from last year um, for Fair Vote Canada, which was Organizing to Win. And then there's some other deeper dive resources on um, developing your own stories and my, as well as my uh, social media links here. So you're very welcome to follow me and reach out if you've got any other questions. Um, and I encourage you just to practice, practice, practice with your, uh, with your stories. It is, it's not something that you do one time. It's a skill that you practice. And the more that you do it, um, the better that you will be at telling your stories. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for being a part of Fair Vote Canada. And thank you, Anna, for taking your time to give us this training to get us started. Always such a pleasure, Anita. Cool. Take good care and congratulations on a great uh, 20th anniversary conference. Very cool. Thanks, Anna. Hopefully we don't have a 40th anniversary conference. That's we'll be con done by the constantly year, right? on yeah. my mind. <laughs> <laughs> we only want to have a winning celebration. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.